Praveen, welcome to the show. Welcome back. Thanks, Amar. I'm very, really, really happy to get come back again to the show. Do you have a, a favorite quote that you can share with us? Something that inspires or motivates you? Yep. I'm a big fan of uh, execution. So I uh, love the quote by Andy Grove, uh, the Intel founder. Uh, he says, like, no strategy is better than its execution. Right? So strategy is always uh, glorified as part of the... Uh, it's very stimulating and, and intellectual right, when you talk. But then uh, it, 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 it is of no value if there's no execution, right? And with execution, strategy can be sharpened and that can become your competitive differentiation. And I've seen that actually uh, in my journey as well. So I, I really love this quote. Great. So for people who aren't familiar with what fix, tell us what does the product do? Who's it for? And what's the main problem you're helping to solve? Yeah, so I think it's been seven to eight years now in the journey, uh, Umar. So but the problem statement has evolved uh, the way we have seen it. So if I have to explain this uh, today, there is like $700 billion worth of enterprise software sold every year. Uh, that translates to 800 to 900 software application in every large enterprise. Uh, so that means they are spending maybe a 700 or two billion dollar a year. They would not see the ROI on those software stack or we call digital transformation until employees or the users adopt them. Then only this digitization will give them the ROI in terms of customer experience or efficiency uh, and so on. Now the adoption of the software is very crucial here. And that's what we help. We create a layer of adoption on top of the underlying software stack, which handholds the user step by step, helps them to complete any task, ensures the process compliance, gives them the nudges uh, on the lead basis, and uh, it in- ensures that uh, employees are engaged and enterprises see the ROI. So it's a new category called digital adoption solutions. And we are one of the pioneers there. Can you give us a sense of the size of the business? Where are you in terms of revenue, customer, size of team? Yeah, so we, we, we are uh, close to 850 people globally. Uh, we have offices and uh, we started from India. We have office now in Atlanta, uh, Bay Area, uh, San Jose, uh, Chicago in the US. We have now office presence in Frankfurt, London, uh, Sydney. Uh, we just started in uh, uh, our global, having our presence in Singapore as well as and now we started in France as well. So 73% of our revenue comes from U.S. market, close to 20% from Western Europe, uh, and 70% comes from uh, Asia Pacific. So we're very focused on four to three to four geographies, and we're really doubling down on them. Uh, 600 customers. Our sweet spot is uh, enterprise. Uh, we are adding uh, close to four to five new Fortune 500 logos every quarter. Uh, we are now more than 70 Fortune 500 companies, 150 global thousand. Typical uh, contract value for us is close to $100,000 a year. So when we talked last time, uh, it was episode 310, we shared the story of what fix and how you and your co-founder Varu had, had built this business and got it to where it is today. I, I love that story because not only do we talk about how you've been able to build a, a multiple eight figure business, but also how you struggle for three years trying to build a product that nobody seemed to be interested in. And I think that resonates potentially with a lot of people out there who are struggling um, and give some hope, right? That, that there's, there's just have to keep going, just have to figure out the, the right thing to, to focus on. You know, and I think, you know, if people want to kind of hear the full story, then go back and listen to, to that episode. But today, what I wanted to do was really to invite you back and uh, learn some of the lessons that, that you guys uh, went through in terms of, you know, figuring out how to scale the business and, and finding that go-to-market fit. And, you know, I think the sort of the story really starts here when you guys had, you'd gone out and started doing the founder led sales, you had probably, I think, 30 or 40 customers at the time, things were looking good, that you'd finally figured out, you know, how to get to product market fit. And now it was just a matter of, you know, let's scale, right? Let's scale. And we're going to hit that hockey stick growth curve and, and things are all going to be good. And it turned out to be a lot more complicated than, than kind of, you know, it initially seemed. So as you and I did discuss, so today is really uh, what we want to try and do is to share seven lessons or seven steps or challenges that you guys went through. And we want to try and unpack those to figure out what was the, the lesson that you learned at each step of the way and how can we then help people who are maybe in that same situation today trying to figure out their own 
you know, go to market fit to take away some, some actionable insights from that. So why don't, why don't we start with the, you know, maybe you can just sort of set the scene where, where you guys were when you sort of had those 30, 40 customers and where you felt you needed to go next, but, uh, things weren't as straightforward as they initially seemed. Yeah, so Omar, actually, we are talking about seven to eight years uh, before today, actually, uh, we're talking about. So we spent three, close to three, three years together product market fit. Uh, maybe we didn't have enough learnings or podcast available at that point. I feel people can iterate and learn faster and don't spend three years like what we spent. Uh, but yeah, coming back. So as, as I was mentioning earlier, like we are a new category, right? So when specifically when you're a new category, it's not... A budgeted line item. Uh, you have to get the budget from different uh, departments or business functions and all, right? So typical sales cycles and uh, are longer. You need to create the market awareness. You do even don't know actually. You have to have a hypothesis. Okay, which segment, which industry, uh, whether it's a small, mid market. So you you have a lot of uh, hypothesis in terms of segment, uh, geography, uh, size of the customer. And, and both of our, both the founders were engineering background, myself and my uh, other co-founder as well. Starting from India, so we thought, okay, the best way to start is target small businesses globally. Because uh, to enter, for enterprise, our initial thought process was that we need to be physically present in that geography to uh, get the market. And we were looking at the global market, specifically US. So we thought, okay, let's start with a small business. Uh, we got that 30, 40 customers, uh, as, as you were mentioning. Uh, and since we were looking at small businesses, uh, typical ACV, uh, we were having around 2000 2500 a year, right? A couple of hundred dollars uh, MRR kind of. We can say that uh, 30, 40 customers are there. means uh, product market fit. We thought so. But then we started digging deeper. We found that there were some of the customers were churning out after a few quarters or a year or so because they were not able to realize the ROI. And when we started investigating uh, why this is happening, the small businesses, their top priority problem statement was how they can scale and what products or what solutions in the market can help them scale or grow. In terms of reducing the support queries or uh, ensuring that learning or training, uh, that was not very you know, high priority problem statement for them. So it was nice to have. Uh, of course, they were buying it uh, because they were wowed with that uh, concept at that point, but then they were not putting enough effort to realize that ROI because it was not a very important uh, for them. So it became nice to have. And we used to see the churn. So even though we got 30, 40 customers, got to close to $100,000 ARR, initially we believed we have a PMF, but actually we didn't get a PMF. So that's where we started looking, okay, how do we solve this? And should we you know, go to different segment, different geography or different uh, sector? You also raised your first round of investment. I think it was about a million dollars. When did that happen? So I think once we got that five to eight customers, or seven, eight customers, we were around $10,000 uh, ARR. That's where we got our seed round of a million dollars uh, because even investors, the problem statement, uh, they, lo- they liked it. They saw that we have uh, uh, five to seven customers are paying us. So this can be scaled. Uh, even we had a decent hypothesis. So they backed us. So that was at that point. Okay, great. So, so basically, this first step was you were going and doing founder-led sales. It was mostly just cold email outreach, and and I know you mentioned as well when we talked last time that you were making sure that you were having face-to-face meetings because when you threw these prices out there, because you didn't know how much to charge, you wanted to see the reaction of people. Yeah, so we were, we were two people company at that point, Omar. Right. So, and we were looking for product market fit. So, what we used to do was uh, we had a basic. Uh, MVP of our product uh, built at that point. And my co-founder used to collect uh, 30, 40 email IDs every day uh, from us, uh, small businesses, uh, their founders, their uh, senior folks. I used to write them personalized email uh, wherever we used to get a response. Uh, and if they were in the same city, we used to actually go in person and uh, see the reaction uh, of, after the demo when we throw them the price points and all, right? Uh, that, that's what was the fastest way we could think of iterating. And that helped actually because we were able to close the 30, 40 customers as I was mentioning. Uh, so both of us were actually working on uh, getting those initial set of customers. Once we got that few uh, customers on board, uh, we, were started, we started getting some support tickets and all. That's when we recruited our first engineering guy and I also got my first sales guy on board. So yeah. So let, let's talk about that. So you've got the, the seed round. You decide that you want to go out and hire salespeople that 
you believe you've got to product market fit or close to it. And now it's just a matter of, of scaling. What happened when you brought the, the sales person on? What did you see with sales? Did they start growing? So uh, again, when, when the, uh, I, I got one sales guy. Uh, we had one engineer and one uh, marketer on board. Uh, now, first few sales I was leading and I asked my sales guy to shadow me. Right? So he used to join all the meetings, but I used to lead those meetings. I wanted him uh, because we didn't have any process to coach a sales guy, you know, in development. Even we both were engineers, so we also don't know how to, how to train the sales guy, right? So we, I just took, uh, took the person along, uh, my sales guy, along with all my deals. I closed three, four deals uh, uh, and he was uh, shadowing me. I reversed uh, after those uh, three, four deals, which he was shadowing. Like I asked my sales guy to lead it now. So he started leading those calls. He started leading those demos. And then I was shadowing him so that I can help him out where were, uh, there were some questions which uh, he could not address. Once he got three to four uh, you know, deals closed, I, I, I thought maybe this is the time. Maybe I can add uh, one or two more sales guys. So I, I recruited one uh, fresh grad and one more uh, experienced salesperson. So it was a team of three. Initially, everybody spent like a few days to build a pipeline, uh, like create some uh, uh, opportunities uh, and then start demonstrating, create that uh, uh, motion. They closed few deals, uh, each one of them. And then there was a lull for the next uh, four to six weeks. And after that, again, they closed three to four deals. Then and again, there was a lull for four to six weeks. Uh, I didn't realize initially what was happening. And then uh, when I started going deeper, I found that, okay, they, they spent some uh, close to a few days or few weeks to create that pipe, generate 15, 20 conversations. When their plate was full with those conversations uh, and there were two or three customers which they think they can close, they used to spend most of their efforts in chasing those customers and closing those deals. When they closed the deals, the remaining seven to eight, they were not so hopeful. Uh, then they start spending again the next few weeks to create the next set of opportunities. So because they, they were playing both the roles like uh, SDR, and AE themselves, right? So it was uh, sequential, you can say. They used to generate opportunities, then close, then generate. Uh, I think uh, being from engineering background, I didn't realize this earlier, I should have had. Uh, but then uh, that was the time when I thought, okay, I should uh, now hire an SDR and uh, help them out. So we recruited a couple of SDRs and who would be responsible for creating the pipe and then AEs would be responsible for only uh, closing the deals. Uh, that's how we got to that 50, 60 customers, late 100, Forty and fifty thousand dollars ARR, but then, which I was mentioning earlier, that uh, issue of uh, not exactly product market fit being nice to have for that particular segment started cropping up uh, when we were actually uh, trying to work with some customers for ROI and all. And we realized that okay, maybe this is not the right segment, and we need to we need to move on. So, how did you f figure out that you needed to hire an SDR uh, to to solve that problem? I mean, you know, you, you said neither of you guys had a sales background. It's funny, I spoke to a founder uh, recently who said, you know, he was, he was running his business for about a year before he even realized or he learned what an SDR was, you know. So how, how did you guys figure that out? Did you have like a basic knowledge of sales? Did you go and look to mentors or people to kind of help you out? But how, how did you kind of navigate through that and figure out, okay, this is the way we need to structure the sales team? Yeah, so actually, uh, uh, when I when I saw this pattern of uh, like one month things were not working out, another one another month we had some deals coming in, I took this problem statement to uh, my investor who had written me seed round, right? To and my the seed investor was actually back uh, had a background of uh, sales operations in uh, in large company uh, prior to that uh, before he became VC. So he I immediately diagnosed this problem and he said, "I think you need an SDR." I asked him, what does it SDR do and how does it work? Uh, then he started explaining and he actually uh, told me the uh, uh, kind of a sales process, what actually would, should evolve for us. Uh, he connected with me a couple of other founders in the different companies, uh, which were a couple of steps ahead of us. I spoke to them. I tried to learn from them, their sales processes. I got a couple of them as an advisor and mentor. Uh, also asked them to write a, if they would, would, they would be interested to write a check on us uh, as an angel investor. We got a few of them. I, I think that also helped. Like then it became a cadence for me, like every quarter, go and speak to a couple of founders, a couple of uh, functional experts. 
uh, try to identify the blind spots uh, because those guys would have navigated them and uh, uh, try to see if I can commit that one or two less mistakes and move faster. Great. So you you, you unpack that issue and you you've got a solution in terms of the way that you're going to have. SDR is really kind of, you know, building the pipeline and generating leads and qualifying, and then the AEs can, can you know, pitch and hopefully close those, those deals. The next challenge was that you, as you started hiring more people, and again, it sort of sounds like, great, we've, un, we've uh, identified this sales problem, we've organized in a better way, now we're going to scale. And then you hit another challenge, which was there were issues around uh consistency in terms of how they were pitching, the use cases they would talk about, what was going on there as you started to grow the sales team? Yeah, I think those uh, consistency part, the enablement part, the problem over it, uh, I feel it's a lifelong, we still face that problem. We have like 150 people sales marketing team and uh, it, it, the problem becomes just more and more complex. Anyway, coming back to, uh, I think once we got to uh, 10 to 12 folks uh, in sales and SDR, I think that's where uh, the first problem what we started look, uh, we started facing was we didn't have enough data to actually even make decisions or enough visibility across the pipe. So first thing was we had to define stages of the sales cycle. We had some crude definition. We had to more uh, put it in place and start using some CRM. Uh, we went for pipe drive at that point. So different stages, what is the movement across different stage? What are the drops? What's the conversion rate? Once you have that kind of data, I think it becomes easier to even actually make some decisions. It's easier to identify the bottlenecks and actually start training people. So I think the number one gap was actually we didn't have those visibility. So again, uh, some of the mentors, some of the advisors helped me saying, okay, you need to start collecting those information, define those uh, gates and uh, stages very clearly and get those uh, uh, metrics, metrics in place. We found that, okay, for some A's, the movements across stages happens more in a much better way for some A's, they get stuck in POC, some are getting stuck in uh, security. So it's it, like some, some, some of them are good in demo uh, because they figured out the wow, they figured out the how to discover the problem and actually uh, address with what fixes the solution. Some of them, you know, but when they move forward, maybe they were, you know, because they were not from a, a non-tech background, so, uh, they, were, they were getting confused when information security discussions comes in. Uh, they were not so comfortable maybe on the deployment uh, uh, questions actually, like how this will get delivered, how this get deployed. Some of the guys who were coming from a little bit tech background because there are a lot of uh, uh, sales reps which are tech engineers with an MBA, right? So they were comfortable on the tech part, but that sometimes they are not comfortable with, with their demo, consist, uh, demo pitches. So we started identifying this problem statements and we realized that, okay, I think the problem is we need to have that clear data based on data, identify those gaps based on those gaps, actually start training and enablement. So uh, I think at 10 to 12 people, we started finding this gap. And as we started scaling, this started, uh, uh, initially it was done by my sales manager, my, myself personally, my other co-founder. And as we grew, like today we have a sales enablement team of around six people. Uh, we have a sales operation team of around seven, six, seven people. So uh, we have a separated out of a sales engineering, sales consultant, who are experts in information security, uh, creating the pitches, creating the demo, doing the uh, proof of concepts. Sales guys are now more specialized for holding holding the room, uh, doing the discovery, identifying the sales process, uh, and, uh, and moving the deal, doing the closure. So there are specialization have come across the company, and each, each specialization now people know that they have to go this specifically in this particular part. They need to answer everything, and for them, we have created the training. We have identified all the courses and modules. So gradually it evolved, but the first enablement, first uh, person would be the founder along with sales manager if it's in place. Yeah, so uh, that problem started uh, when we were actually, we crossed 10 people. And, and it sounds like, as you mentioned, it, it happens as you keep growing sales, it still keeps keeps happening, is it? Yeah, it's, it happens today also. Like I think my every every few days, this discussion comes back to table again and again and again, right? Like today, we are uh, uh, evolving ourselves from single product to multi product company. Now, can I enable all the sales guys for us, different two different products? Should I enable only few guys and see? Should I have a sales engineer, specialized sales engineer for product one, product two? So there are so many questions which we need to answer. How do we structure this now as an organization, right? 
And uh, if the deal comes where both the products are required, there will be two AEs, two sales engineers. Again, nobody wants to talk to so many people uh, right in a sales deal. So uh, it sounds simple sometimes, but there are too much of complexities involved at, when you're doing this at scale. We are, we are doing actually, we can say we are handling around 400 to 450 opportunities every quarter now. Awesome. All right. So let's talk about the next challenge, which was really around moving up market to enterprise customers. And from what I understand at the time, you were getting a mixture of leads. So there were the small SMB type leads coming through. There were enterprise leads. And the, the, one of the challenges that you, you were facing was that a, a large chunk of your revenue was still coming from small businesses, but you knew that you needed to move up market towards enterprise. So tell us about that. What was going on? What kind of problems did you start experiencing? So, so the use case, what actually started evolving was actually if the product is more complex, uh, what fix would be a best fit when the product is complex and there are more number of users on top of it. Now, if I look at CRMs or ERPs, they're pretty complex uh, applications. And if I look at any company, which is, let's say, 50 people team, and there are only 10 sales rep, and they are using a CRM, even though if it, it, it might be Dynamics or SAPs or Salesforce, those 10 people would work together and they may not need that kind of hand-holding, which I would provide uh, by a Wattfix. But now imagine there's three different geographies. There are 200 sales guys. They are using a CRM along with CPQ, CLM. No solution is not pretty complex. Any change in the process, any change in the compliance, uh, 200 people to be trained, making them adoption, uh, making them adopt this uh, uh, process or features, it's hard, right? Uh, and nobody wants to read emails or training manuals and all, right? So it, it's, it, it became very natural for us that as the number of uh, uh, employees increase, the treatment would be better. Uh, and by the time we had a couple of customers where we saw that there's a clear ROI and there was a high, high paying capacity uh, because they were, they were willing to pay much more for this problem. But since uh, we were, let's say, quarter million kind of an ARR to $50,000 and then 200000 or 220000 coming from small businesses, it's like going back to 2030K ARR if I dumped all the small businesses, which was actually paying some of our bills, Right. So what we did, uh, instead of taking a very bold decision of just saying, okay, I'll stop everything and I'll go to uh, uh, enterprise, uh, we started increasing our floor price. So instead of $2,000, which we started with a year, we said, okay, now we're going to do $4,000. We're not going to entertain any deals below that. So that whoever is not able to pay, they'll churn out. Uh, and who are able to pay, they may be able to put more effort to see the ROI of the solutions. Uh, from four, we made it eight. And from then from eight, we made it 10. And we saw eventually that companies which are less than 100 people or 150 people, they actually stopped uh, buying the solution. And gradually we had customers mostly with 150, 200 employees to 1,000, which became our uh, small to mid market or emerging market, what we call. And more than 1,000 employees started becoming our enterprise and more than 5,000 became our larger enterprise. So that, that's how we did. We gradually started uh, increasing our floor and started moving up in the market. Early on when our uh, floor was, let's say $2,000, we never used to boldly ask the customer saying that, okay, this is our price, would you be ready to pay? But when we when we realized and we started building some pipe in the enterprise, we used to call out in the qualification stage itself that this is the minimum price point and if you are willing, you know, we can arrange for a demo. So uh, that's how we started filtering more and more strictly uh, and we started moving more and more up market. So today, if I have to say, Close to 95% of my revenue comes from 1,000 plus employee companies. And remaining 5% would be between 200 to 1,000 people. How long did it take you to make that transition from being in the situation where you're getting a mixture of leads to a point where you say, no, we are, we are definitely focused on enterprise customers. We've made that transition. How long did it take? And in hindsight, do you think it was still the right approach or could you have got there faster? Yeah, so it took me 15 to 18 months, actually, uh, because we were also not very confident how to generate enterprise leads. So cutting off uh, that small businesses uh, would have actually crashed our revenue. And we didn't know that the new funding would come in, whether I'll be able to generate enterprise leads. Uh, we thought we'll buy some time. So it took 15 to 18 months. By the time we were able to figure out our enterprise play, uh, we got the product uh, to it. 
we got uh, participated in a few events. Uh, we bounced off our solution, identified the use case. I think crystallized our messaging, what would actually resonate with enterprise customers, fix some of the information security or deployment issues, what typically enterprise customer would look, but not small businesses won't matter. For, for them, it won't matter. Get some certifications in place like ISO, SOC 2. So it gave, gave us a time. Given a choice, uh, inside if I have to say, maybe if I would have directly moved all my resources to focus on enterprise customers, it would have helped me to crash, uh, uh, maybe save maybe four to six months, definitely. But again, uh, that at that point, uh, I had to balance out between cash uh, uh, revenue coming in versus uh, speed of moving to enterprise. Today, it sounds I should have done maybe the uh, letter one directly move to enterprise faster. But yeah, anyway, I think we have we have landed here, so all fine. Yeah, and and totally, and there's so much uncertainty at the time. You don't know if you're going to be able to to move up market, how much you'll be able to charge, and and so on. <laughs> I'll tell you one story actually, Omar. Like, so I was in in one of the events. Uh, I, I feel it was Dreamforce uh, event in 2016. We were averaging our price points were three or four thousand dollars a year at that point, right? And uh, we were validating our enterprise play. One of the enterprise customers, VP, dropped to our booth. We gave them the demo. He was wow. Okay, this is this is great. I have uh, uh, one of the ERP solutions with seven hundred, eight hundred users. What would be the price? We were so used to telling three thousand, four thousand. We said, okay, we'll tell the higher price. Let's bounce off uh, eight thousand dollars. You know, the person said, okay, 18 to 12, 96,000, that looks fine. You know, we were, we, we were so scared that, okay, we were trying to say 8,000 a year. He thought it was $96,000 a, 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 a year. Uh, 8,000 was $8,000 a month, right? So that's when we started learning, like, okay, the enterprise uh, price points and the value, and it's quite different, actually. And, yeah, I, I want to talk about that because you have another great story about pricing with enterprise that, that I, I want to cover. But uh, before we get into that, so... So you, you, you make the transition to enterprise and now it's like, yeah, now you'll be able to scale, right? Everything is, is kind of falling into place. You've got the sales team, you know who you're targeting. But then you, you also had to face uh, uh, some challenges around how to segment the market. Like you were now selling to customers worldwide. You had different markets to, to prioritize. You were still at the time still selling everything from, from India to, to customers around the world. So t- tell us what was going on there at the time and, and again, what, what problems started to emerge from that? Yeah, so what happens when you, when you are selling it remote and when you are relying on inbound as a channel, you would get leads from across the world. Like you might get a lead from South Africa and then the next day you might get it from France or Germany and then from Australia. And you have three to four sales guys you're not divided them into geographies. Uh, same guy is actually working in the morning and giving a demo to Australian customer. And then evening, we are expecting him to give to someone else. And, and imagine the same thing with SDRs or later on with the support and engineering when they have to do some quick fixes, right? So operationally, it becomes a nightmare. Uh, this was a good part. We realized pretty early on uh, that it's not possible to actually manage multiple geographies with a lean team. Uh, it won't be efficient and it won't be right. So we thought, okay, since we are in India, if anything comes from India, we'll entertain. But apart from India, we'll just focus on one geography. And uh, naturally, it was US. So we aligned our team, like uh, 60, 70% of our sales, marketing, uh, customer support. We aligned that everybody would be working in shift. They would be starting at 5 p.m. in India time, continue till 2.33 a.m. And uh, engineering and some other guys would be in the day and maybe one of the sales guys uh, would be working. Even I changed my time zone. That actually helped us operationally because otherwise somebody sends an email, uh, a potential customer from U.S. sends an email at midnight 12. Nobody responds. Next day, we respond in the morning. Like It's like 36, 48 hours of lag and that's very bad customer experience. So I, we realized pretty early and when we, when we operationally we changed all this, uh, it helped. And any other lead coming from other geographies, it used to be nice to have. One of our daytime sales guy would respond. If it comes in, closes, it's fine. If it doesn't close, no need to fret too much about it. But any deals from the US or India, we should address it with up, utmost uh, customer and gives rock solid customer experience and sales experience. So that was the first choice we made. The second, uh, after US, of course, more leads were coming in from different parts of the world. So it, 
again, the question was like, where do we expand more? So we thought, okay, let's continue to doubling down on the US market. So my co-founder relocated to US. Uh, we hired a couple of local folks. So he used to double down going to customers if there was a FaceTime required or giving an in-person demo, or customized demo, do some POCs. Uh, so we started having a, some physical presence uh, in, in the US geography. And since English was again a language which, which was uh, comfortable for us, uh, any other geography where there, was, there would be an expectation of supporting different collaterals in different language or supporting different language would be, again, we thought it would be operationally very hard to pull it off in early days. So we thought, okay, let's now focus only on UK after US, which is again, again an English speaking country. So after US, we thought UK and UK also, one of the other reasons would be it, the time zone also matches very well with India, right? So they start around 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. India time. And then if I am there till 10, 11 in the night, I think we covered the Europe time zone or primary UK time zone. So UK, we was the next one. And then we, after a year or so, we hired a couple of folks in UK. We transferred one guy from India as well. Third one, we thought, okay, after you know, US, UK, India, then we thought, okay, let's continue with English. Let's not do more of any other language yet. We, start, we started getting some customers from Germany, France, different countries. We were supporting English. We were losing some customers because of the language issues and other stuff, no, not local presence. But again, we were very clear. That's nice to have for now. Let's focus where we can actually use our existing website, existing collaterals. So we started focusing on Australia. And when the time came, okay, now we've had to further double down, further scale up. Uh, in terms of geography, I thought well, now it's time to expand in the first non-English country. So we uh, narrowed down on Germany because we had by then uh, only 78 customers in Germany. So we also had built muscle by the time in terms of company. There were 300, 400 people. So we did some six, seven people local hiring, use of our existing customers, created a complete collaterals in that language, and we doubled down in Germany. And that became a playbook, right? It worked really well for us. And now it becomes like how I can replicate that for other geographies. Maybe I part to do for French or to do for Japan. So that's how, that's, that's what the approach Omar, actually, to resolve the operational challenge which would come, to resolve the cultural or language barriers which we would face. So that's how we navigate it. And some of those issues, I feel, were still, uh, I, I would repeat the same. Way. And, then, and then what happened when you made those changes? Well, how, how did it affect sales? How did it affect your, uh, your go-to-market? So, yeah, it, it worked well, actually, right? Like, uh, if, 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 because since we were really focused well on initial days on US, the number of, the number of logos which we collect from a, from a specific one geography, that helps actually to build the trust, to help, helps that, helps to build uh, some kind of a uh, word of mouth or virality within that particular industry or particular segment. So when we used to go for a event in the US or let's say Dreamforce or some other event, we used to have five, six customers visiting us in our booth and a few other guys were potential customers. We used to make them handshakes saying, hey man, just meet this guy. He's been using us for a couple of years. So I think that momentum builds up. You can focus on PR, you can focus on your branding, everything in one or two geographies, right? You can't spread too thin. So that helped us to really build very solid momentum in the US. And I was mentioning earlier, like today also like 70, close to 75% of our revenue comes from the US market. And we are now getting so many Fortune customers uh, every quarter. And by the time we build, uh, we went to UK uh, when we started creating the uh, footprint uh, locally in that market. That same playbook helped us again, like, okay, getting those few large customers within that geography, using them in that events, uh, repeating those, uh, uh, how to use the customer for evangelism and uh, get more customers. And then we did the first time we did that a couple of years back for Germany uh, for a non-English language. So I think those learning, those playbook, uh, once it establishes, it's very, it becomes very easy to replicate it afterwards. Okay, let, let's talk about uh, the, the next challenge you faced, which was around pricing. Now, th this was... This was something that we've talked about, you know, from, from the early days to going and talking to small customers and, and trying to see, you know, the, gauge the reactions and see what they're willing to pay to that story you, you shared about the, the enterprise customer coming, seeing you at the booth at the event. There was a large uh, enterprise customer in, in the US that a deal that you looked really promising, but you ended up losing. And, and a lot of that was, from what I understand, down to the way you priced that or the, the quote you provided. Can you, can you tell us about that? Because I think that's a great story. 
Yeah, so uh, so early on, actually, uh, we were pricing based on some assumptions what we had in terms of how much somebody would pay for it because we didn't have a very hard ROI uh, value uh, parameters. Uh, but the best best way we learned over a period of time is like, okay, what kind of a value we provide to customers and actually price it accordingly. So if you are on a, let's say if I am demonstrating a customer set of features and then I say, okay, I'm going to price you X. So the customer is actually evaluating me as a tool um, because it's they're just, just buying some set of features. But if I'm demonstrating a product with a solution for the problem what, they're in, what they are uh, looking to solve and they say, and then I quantify that, okay, this problem uh, which you're looking at, WhatFix will be able to solve and make you derive an ROI of $3 million. I'm sure the person is not expecting in the next slide that I'm going to say $3,000 as, as, as a price point, right? I can actually even price it a quarter million or $300,000 because you're setting that uh, uh, value. So that, that's how we evolved uh, uh, ourselves as well. But coming back to that story which you were referring to, so we were talking to one of the largest banks in the States uh, very early on. Uh, I think we hardly had a couple of uh, enterprise customers uh, at that point. Uh, we didn't want to lose that deal. Actually, it's not like we wanted to win that deal, right? So you, you become too defensive. Uh, they wanted to have used WhatFix on, uh, I think, ten to fifteen thousand sales uh, sales reps uh, on a CRM. We had by then only sold WhatFix max on thousand seats uh, on a CRM, and they said, okay, uh, for us it was like an unlimited license on on, on a CRM. So we priced it around seventy seventy five thousand dollars. Everything was going fine. Three, four rounds of discussions, demos. And we built some champions. They were saying, man, your tool looks awesome. We have tried it. Everything looks fine. Give us a quote. And then we, after giving the quote, we never heard back. Uh, we thought, man, uh, we, <laughs> we, uh, I think we gave too much price. We should have given 25K instead of 75K. You, so, so you thought you had, over, you had charged too much? Yes. And then uh, fast forward a year down the line, we hired a uh, uh, head of sales in the in, in US. Uh, he joined, he was going through our CRM. He said, man, why did you lose this particular deal? Because I know a friend uh, who, is, uh, who is a VP of sales in this particular bank. And he reasoned. So uh, we said, yeah, I think we priced high. He said, okay, let me find out. He gave him a call. He called me back a couple of days later. He said, I spoke to him. He said, boss, I had two quotes on my table. One was around $300,000, $400,000 and one was $75K. I've spent like tens of millions of dollars on my CRM. I don't know whether this company can even support. They don't even know what it would cost to hire one customer support person in US. I need a partner who would be long-term with me, not someone who would not even survive after six months, a company which would not survive. So we, we realized actually we underpriced because the value was much higher the person was uh, looking for a long-term partner rather than a tool or a vendor. That was, that was a really uh, good lesson to learn. By the way, Omar, last quarter, we won that customer back. Nice. Nice. That's a good ending to that story. I love it. Yes. Yeah, so I think we, we spoke a year back. I think we didn't have this customer and they came up uh, early this year. They were not happy with the, uh, the different vendor. And now I think, yeah, we priced them the right way. You, you didn't charge them 75000 this time. <laughs> All right, great. So um, the challenge number seven was really about figuring out how to narrow focus. So, you know, we, we've talked about sort of taking this journey through building out the sales team, figuring out how to uh, get more uh, consistency in, in the way the sales process works, um, the pitches, the use cases, so on, moving over to enterprise customers, and then learning to segment the market and some of the lessons you learned around pricing along the way, which, uh, which help. But the, the other thing was the, the, from what I understand is that despite getting focused on enterprise and the U S market and all of that stuff, you really still had a very broad use case on how, what fix could work and what type of software or applications it could be used for. And that that was still creating, I, I, I assume that you, especially as engineering guys, you look at that and say, well, of course, that's the way you want to build something, right? Because then it, it has kind of universal appeal. But that was creating a bunch of issues for you, right? That's right. So so uh, let me give you some context, actually. So initially, we thought, we, we, were, we were looking at WhatFix as a solution, which will help onboard, adopt any software. 
Now, when I when I look at this problem, the potential use cases can be I can help a product manager to onboard their end users. It can be B two C product manager for a bank portal or a consumer store a software. It can be a B two B SaaS product manager who want to onboard their uh, SMB customers or enterprise customers. I can use WhatFix for onboarding adoption of an employee inside an organization on a third party software like CRM, ERP, or a custom software. Right now, this gives too many different variations. Like if I'm uh, if I'm using WhatFix on an e-commerce portal, if the e-commerce portal has a million hits every day, maybe few of them might use WhatFix, uh, maybe 0.5% or so. So what would I price? What kind of use cases they would like to have? Maybe they don't want WhatFix in every different buttons or pages. They might need maybe only in few areas, right? Uh, if I look at for B2B SaaS product manager, they want to maybe use WhatFix to nudge and create more free trial to uh, conversion. But when I'm looking for uh, enterprise employee experience use case internal to organization, an operations guy or a CIO office or IT office want actually employees to adopt the process, be more compliant. And there are people like l and in, in the former case, there are product managers who are ready to customize, use WhatFix APIs, and uh, but they need some it to be very well integrated with their underlying platform. But if I go into the later use case of employee experience, if I say, okay, there are 20 APIs which you need to integrate, they will start scratching their head. Okay, do I need to go to service company like Infosys, Accenture, or someone to get this customized? Because I, an l and folks or sometimes, you know, let's say, large comp- non-tech company or manufacturing, they don't even know where the engineering guys are. So the product, when you start going deeper, the product starts evolving differently, right? Initially, it didn't occur to us unless, unless we started looking at some of these use cases and started going deeper. Second, you cannot build your differentiations in all these use cases, all the market. You need to pick your battles, right? It, it occurred to us a little also hard way. Actually, I was pitching to some of the investors for my Series B round, and I was mentioning all these use cases. And I was very proud that it shows a huge tag. And they asked, like, what's the differentiation in each one? Which you are stronger? I was trying to blabber around, say, okay, we are doing this, we are doing that. There are a few customers here, a few customers here, a few customers here. He, the investor wanted to push me saying that, okay, pick one and go deep. Finally, he asked me, and I was not actually narrowing down. Finally, he asked me one question. Let's see if I put a gun on your head and I you to pick one. Which one would that be? And he immediately pointed at one of the use cases. So that is employee experience. And he asked me why. I gave my three reasons because my product was easy to deploy, author, and maintain, and it resonates with the particular buyer persona and the people who use this uh, in this particular use case. We have a strong product differentiation as well. And we and the paying capacity of this particular category or segment is much, much, much maybe way higher. He said, then you should do that. Actually, I came back, thought a lot and said, yeah, yeah that, that, that's the right thing we should do. And that's where actually we started pivoting. Uh, not pivoting, I would say narrowing down actually. Uh, I'll tell you one more uh, uh, case study here. So now, even in this particular case, i am always been talking about adoption, learning, onboarding, training, right? So if I have to do a value parameter, I can always prove that, okay, I'm going to reduce your 40% of your support tickets. And if, if, if for a company, let's say, if they're getting 1,000 support tickets, I can multiply by X number of hours or dollars, and I can show, okay, you're going to save a million dollars, I can save you 50, I can charge you 50K or 100K for one application. Now, still, it's a little horizontal. Within, within employee experience itself, within internal, we further actually, a few quarters back, we started narrowing on even further. So we, we, we didn't actually start going, uh, like we came up with a different approach like T, like be horizontal for employee experience, but figure out some more niche. Now, I'll give you an example, like let's say if I'm going for a claims, claims insurance, insurance claims actually, uh, for a property casualty or life annuity or something. Now, instead of saying, and I'm going to help you with reducing your support tickets or I'm going to help your employees to onboard faster. If I can tell them that I'm going to help you reduce your claims processing time. Now, that's the business metric. Everybody's concerned in that particular department, business department. It's not only botheration of an enablement guy or operations guy, but even the chief business manager or a head of business line. Maybe they are doing $200 million claims every, every quarter or every year. And if I can move that needle by even half a percentage point in terms of uh, timing and efficiency and all, it's, it's, it's a big inflection. I can say, okay, I can improve your transaction and NPS after every insurer which uh, provides you. 
I can uh, reduce your claims or in- compliance error because anybody defaults is actually have to be maybe potentially there might be a million dollar penalty there. Now, these are very hard business KPIs which I can influence. I would not have, could not have possibly find this kind of metric if I would not have narrowed down further domain or in industry use case. So that really resonated very, very well. And our capacity to price point of price point actually even went higher. And then we started slicing much more. Our TAM, which was looking bigger, actually now became much more realizable. So I, I feel the narrowing down actually helps to identify those hardcore, hard ROI parameters or value parameters. You can price better. You can message better. You can pitch better. It resonates with maybe the right business buyer or something. So, so I think that, that's how I think we evolved by narrowing down. Yeah, and it's such a difficult decision to make when you're in the middle of it because you're looking at this this uh, landscape and you're saying, but the product can help so many industries, so many apps, so many use cases. And that that doesn't that show us that we have this huge opportunity, right? And if we then, you know, put... 95% of that to the side and say, we're going to focus on one, one thing, one app, right? That feels like such a counterintuitive thing. It's so difficult. You, you, you touched on it a little bit, but just for someone who's maybe going through that and struggling to, to really narrow down, just what, what's some advice that you would offer them in terms of helping to take that leap and, and commit to, to one market or one use case? Yeah, so when, when you narrow down, actually, as I was mentioning, uh, your value parameters become crystal clear, right? As I was uh, giving an example of that insurance use case. It's very easy to enable most of your ease. It's easy to actually qualify your incoming leads because whatever you're telling them about the value of the solution, it resonates very, very quickly. So your sales cycle starts quizzing. You are charging now 2x or 3x what you were initially thinking. Because you are able to enable and message position very well, your win rate goes up, maybe actually double sometimes. Now, you are doing every activity much more efficiently and at a higher price point. So with the horizontal approach, it sounds that very jazzy that, okay, you have a lot of time. But then if your win rates are, let's say, 15%, your price points are, let's say, 10K, imagine your price can... Point can go to 3x, 30k, your win rate from 15% becomes 40%. With even the less number of people, actually, you would accelerate and do much faster and much better. Second, when you win those deals, let's say in insurance, you have out of top 25 insurers, you have five already on board now with some hard work. Now you are having OEM players or SIs working with you for that particular. It becomes inevitable or it becomes very easy to get the other 15 and the sales cycles and all starts becoming much, much smaller. And in our case specifically, if I am getting into ERP or if I am getting into CRM or HR software, vis a if I am getting into core business application with a, with a buy-in from a business leader, it becomes much more sticky and I can actually spread across the organization also very quickly. So there are a lot more benefits uh, and actually it helps you to accelerate much faster. Great, great points. We should, uh, we should wrap up, get on to the lightning round. You've done this before. So you know what to expect. I'm going to ask you seven quick fire questions. Just try to answer them as quickly as you can. You ready? Yep, let's go ahead. What's one piece of business advice uh, that you've received? One advice actually, which I really love, which I, I think I read in one of the presentations, uh, I don't remember exactly, it was six, seven years back, which mentioned that never over-designate people when you hire them. Because in early days, actually you you are not even in position to actually evaluate people. And it's very easy to just attract some talent. You uh, keep desi- over-designating them. So maybe if I got a director, potentially, let's say, a director of marketing, because I don't know how to evaluate and just want to attract and I give them VP or CMO. I will, oh, the company overgrows in a year. The person would have been a fantastic director. But now, since you need a VP, maybe you would lose, lose that guy. So I think I, when I read that advice and we implemented it has even terrific result. You need to do expectation management, but it works. Great. What book would you recommend to our audience and why? Hard thing about hard things, right? So a lot of things which we discussed, I think every, every entrepreneur goes through uh, those ups and downs. So there are really good stories by Anderson there. 
uh, I, I think it's, it's a must read for most of the entrepreneurs. What's one attribute or characteristic in your mind of a successful founder? Curiosity. A founder has to be curious uh, to keep questioning. Uh, if they want to solve the problem uh, with a first principle approach, they need to talk around, they need to figure it out why this is, has to be built like this, why this has process is uh, supposed to be like this, why this org structure has to be like this. Uh, if they're curious, if they can learn, I think they can iterate and they can uh, build it much better. What's your favorite personal productivity tool or habit? Productivity tool. I uh, currently use actually more of Slack. Uh, so uh, keep creating, I keep creating channels for a specific uh, area, which actually is bothering me. I identify pulling some people, debate there, call for a quick uh, meeting if it doesn't get resolved. So I think it, it is, it, it's, it's a becoming a good uh, brainstorming for me without, which can work even in asynchronous mode. What, what's a new or crazy business idea you'd love to pursue if you had the time? I would like to replicate what I'm doing in uh, AR. What fix for AR? With AR, actually. Interesting idea. Um, what's an interesting or fun fact about you that most people don't know? I don't know whether you call it fun fact or not. I have two kids, uh, uh, 18 and 14. Actually, I spend a good amount of time uh, doing some small 3D printing with them, uh, doing some small uh, programming with them in terms of building some small robots and all. So, yeah, I, I think it's a stress buster, good, time, good way to spend time with the kids. Uh, and also learn some basics. Awesome. And finally, what's one of your most important passions outside of your work? I think spending time with family, actually. As much as time I can spend on the weekends, uh, because weekdays really don't get much time. Apart from family and work, uh, whenever I'm driving over, uh, whenever I get some other free time, go through some podcast. I'm one of the fan of your podcast as well. Thank you. And uh, read some uh, some books as, as I was quoting one of them. So, Try to, I'm trying to read maybe at least one book a quarter. I want to increase it to one, one a month. But yeah, I'm a little bit uh, more lazy there. Thank you so much for coming back. I think it's been a pleasure. And uh, you're one of those people that I never uh, run out of stuff to talk about. And uh, I feel like we could keep this conversation going for, for another few hours. So thank you so much for, for making the time, staying up late, and, and for most importantly, sharing sharing those lessons that you learned in terms of going through that evolution and figuring out, you know, from product market fit to go to market fit and, and the, the journey that you took. And I think hopefully that's going to be valuable for, for a lot of other founders who are maybe uh, going through that process today. So, so appreciate that. If people want to learn more about what fix, they can go to whatfix.com. And if folks want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? So you can reach out to me over my email, Kadim at whatfix.com or connect me over on LinkedIn, Kadim Bhatti. Uh, and it's a really pleasure to be on this uh, uh, podcast, uh, Omar. It helps me relieve the journey, what we went through. Happy to do it again. We, we, maybe we should make this a, an annual event to keep checking in and see where you're going. Yeah, we'll do more mistakes and we'll share more learnings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, please make more mistakes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.